right, welcome to episode number 15 of Dial a Drummer. I'm Brian Stevens. I'm Shannon Corey. And we're just a couple of working drummer dudes who jump on some cameras every so often and uh, get in front of the interwebs and talk about drums. And today we're going to put our business hats on and talk about Absolutely. business stuff. But before we do that, I need to remind you guys, email us, dialadrummer at gmail.com. And please, by all means, follow us on pretty much every social network. We are Dial a Drummer everywhere. Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, Twitter. If you're on Twitch right now and you're 12 years old and you play Mario Kart at three in the afternoon, you can find us. You can find us on Twitch. Uh, of course, you're probably not even looking for us because you're playing Mario Kart. <laughs> That's true. But um, also, uh, we need even more subscribers. We're still working for that magic close. number. Triple digits is what we're looking Triple for. Triple digits. So that we can uh, secure Dollar Drummer as our YouTube handle. And uh, win the trifecta, the triple crown of social media. And uh, you guys can help. You guys can help. And you guys can help. And... I'm just exercising. <laughs> I'm making more work for myself in the edit right now because I'm actually having to physically cut over that camera. An Austin something. Powers moment. Where it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thanks guys for uh, checking us out uh, every week. And please share us with your friends if you dig the stuff we talk about and if you're slightly entertained by the things that we say and or do on this here little show. Absolutely. So... This week, we're talking about musicians, specifically drummers, and multiple income streams. And uh, you may not you may not be familiar with this concept because I think there's a fallacy that if you're a successful working drummer, you your name's either Dave Grohl <laughs> or the only thing you do from the time you wake up, to the time you go to sleep is you play drum. Right. And especially in 2017, I don't think there's a, anything that could be any more untrue sure. than that. So what we want to do today is we want to um, pull the veil back that's in front of our own lives. We're going to pull that veil back on our lives. We're going to talk about uh, what our current income streams are as working drummers and, and really working creative professionals. Um, we're going to talk about why having multiple income streams is so incredibly important. We're going to talk about how to decide on what income streams might work for you or your market where you live. And then we're going to maybe brainstorm a little bit and maybe brainstorm with some callers about um, – possibilities for alternate income streams. Now, keep in mind, we, we want to keep these all drum and or music, music related. related. Yeah, we're all talking about the same circle of stuff. We're not, we're not, we're talking, not saying go get a day job at Home Depot and then, you know. We're, yeah, we're not talking about my new investments in Bitcoin right, right, right. and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It, it, it all relates stuff. to music, all things yeah, musical. Yeah, yeah, the things that we're talking about today, drums and music. Yep. The rest of it will be for another show at another time um, because there are some interesting things that drummers are doing outside yeah. of music that, that are uh, revenue generators for Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Uh, and even uh, people like Brian May from Queen. I mean, he's like an astrophysicist when he's not a rock star. Right. It, it, he couldn't just be marginally good at either one. He had to be like – Top level, world class. He's literally a genius. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so we're and in fact, you know, put it on our whiteboard. We were talking about our whiteboard today with all our topics. We're going to find a genius, and we're going to talk to a genius that has done said kind of thing. It may not be Brian May, but it'll be someone equally as geniferous, geniferous. as uh, as that. So. Nice. Uh, so anyway, so uh, Shannon, if you had to lay out for someone your multiple income streams, what would they be today? Today. Okay. So first of all, I'll start with, you know, there's gigs. That's one mm -hmm. way to generate income. Yep. Um, the majority of the work that I do is studio and recording work. Yep. 
I do some engineering as well. Having a studio, you know, you end up doing that as well. Yeah. Um, production. Yep. You know, um, some of the other things that I will do, I mean, that's, that's the bulk of what I do, but I also help a lot of people tune their instruments. Yep. Um, you know, drum rack design, mm-hmm. other, you know, all things drum related, just cleaning up your setup. Yep. Especially with, you know, all the technology showing people how to, especially for drummers. And we've talked about the in-ear mixes and making your life easier, yeah. Yeah. you know, helping people with that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, right off the bat, that would be the first five. For five, yeah. That's a good, <laughs> it's a, that's a good starting place. Right, right. Yeah, it's a good starting place. Because even within those can expand oh, exponentially. Yeah. You can you can drill down in any one of those areas and come up with a whole lot of different possibilities. And, and we're going to do that a little bit today as we're talking. For me, uh, currently, for ease and compartmentalization for me, I, I tend to look at things from families of service lines mm-hmm. and now product lines. Um in my drum world, I do the same thing that you do. I spend time playing gigs. I played a gig on Saturday. Right. Uh, I had two gigs last week. And uh, the wonderful thing about a lot of the gigs that I play, people go out of their way that hire me. They go out of their way to make sure it's worth my time to pack up a set of drums right. and get in the car and drive to wherever they're at. And play music with them or for them. And so when I say that I had two gigs last week, I don't know that my wife makes as much in an an entire week as as I did in just those two Two gigs. gigs, Um, And that may not be the reality for guys who are starting out as drummers, but especially when you've been doing this for 20 years, if you can string enough days together and you can move up that food chain and the right kind of work, the right. And you can, you can really be smart about how you plan your work. We're going to talk about that. Uh, you can eventually move into a tier where, uh, you're not playing $50 bar gigs unless you choose to be there. Right. So is that, that's a whole nother show. There's a whole nother show. But that, that makes it very difficult to sustain. Right income if you're you know working four hours a night for very little yeah yeah at a certain point it's an easy way to get burned out well, too. when it comes when it comes to the gig thing and, and i had to i had to ask myself this a long time ago i had to ask myself why i'm playing the gig mm-hmm. and if the answer to that now that answer can be anything sure but and it'll change from day to day but if the answer is i'm playing this gig to help pay my light bill or to pay my mortgage or Uh, child support or alimony uh you know if if i'm trying to pay a bill then uh i need to be smart about how i spend my time because if you amortize what i'm making across the time it takes and i end up making 1250 an hour i can do better working at ups right right so um in less time yeah in less time more money and uh, for me especially with gigs it a lot of times I have to look at if the answer is this is part of my income to pay for my life. Mm -hmm. I have to answer that question for myself of am I okay with saying no to this gig because it's a hundred bucks. Right. And the eight hours it's going to take me to make a hundred bucks, I could do something else. And the the 20 hours of learning a set you've never played. Yeah. 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 A whole bunch of songs (laughs) that you've never played before. Uh, Well, and two, when the great thing about having multiple income streams before we get into the why is that um, one of the reasons I can make that decision and not play the hundred dollar gig is I've got some other ways that I can fill the time that financially are more lucrative. Um, But so playing gigs, Doing recording sessions. That was the reason in 1999 when I opened my first studio. The main reason why I did that was so that I could have a place to record myself as a session drummer. Right. And instead of relying on people to figure out they needed a drummer for uh, for a recording session and then go through the layers of people that you have to talk to to get a drummer there, you know, because most artists don't know, if they're singer-songwriters, they don't know drummers to call that are sure. studio-worthy, album-worthy. So you have to talk to the engineer. You have to talk to the producer. If you have a producer, you have to talk to the musicians. There's you got to hope of, they have a budget. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, it made it a lot easier if I, if I was an all-in-one, like – as long as you knew you needed a drum track, 
I would be one of the guys you could call in 1999 right. that had a full commercially uh, viable recording place facility. to go. Sure. And great drums, great cymbals. And I played marginally well in 1999. So I could pass <laughs> on most uh, vanity projects. So, um, so recording work is another part of that. Uh, when it comes to playing, that comp that comprises the main two things because mm -hmm. we're either recording or we're playing live. Right. Now, in any one of those, we can drill down a lot. But um, so that is my drum life. There's the audio engineer part of my life that really forks into live and studio because uh, my studio the the way it's set up we can record most anything mm -hmm. so i have people that come in that they're working on entire projects or they may be just coming in to do uh, overdubs maybe they don't have a great place to do vocals right. or they can't do screaming martial rock guitar at 2 a.m in their apartment but they can do it at my place right doesn't bother me at all um, so uh, I also do a lot of mixing and a lot of mastering for people. I just finished doing a bunch of uh, sonic surgery and mixing mastering for a big video project for uh, the Society of Southeastern Foresters or something. Oh, nice. Um, it was about like 12 different promo videos for this agency that all these foresters from Texas to the East Coast, they're all a part of this agency. So, uh, so things like that. It's not just album projects it's uh, anything that has audio or video i've got corporate clients that i work on podcasts for every single week so uh if it's audio i'm probably handling it in the studio uh video is a new service line that uh, i tend to work on some of those and then i hire out the rest of them right you know if it's something i'm really going to dig i'll do if not i just farm know, it out yeah farm it out Put an extra 20% on and uh, keep well, moving. Keep working. Uh, for the live stuff, obviously, uh, I've got a church gig. Uh, for years, I played drums in church, and that was my Sunday gig. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that if you knew how to run front of house, you could make two or three times as much money. <laughs> right. And if you could actually hear the guy who was our sound guy on my first church gig was 80% deaf in one ear and totally deaf in the other ear. Perfect. But he showed up every Sunday on time right. and every other Sunday had a really good attitude. Right. So he got the gig. <laughs> yeah. He was the free sound guy. Yeah. Um, but you know, and, and I, the I felt term is volunteer. Volunteer. I'm volunteer. Sorry. That gets around we don't want to pay. Right. <laughs> it's another it seems, show. This seems like a theme in my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean but to sidetrack you. But I digress. Uh, anyway, so the um, so so uh, on Sundays I'm running front of house in a, in a church and I, I multitask a lot. There are times when you may be looking at me and seeing me, and I'm actually doing three or four things at once. Uh, some things you can see, some things you you're, you can't see. Right, right. I was running sound for an event uh, last week, and I was uh, reformatting uh, a computer to do audio and vis video presentation stuff while I'm running sound, <laughs> and I was scheduling a whole calendar of events for the other guys that work for me all at the same time. Nice. And uh, so I was trying to be, I was trying to be valuable, you know, because, uh, because I can. Busy man. Yeah, and, uh, and that's one of... We'll get into the how in a right, little right. bit, but sure. that's that's one of the ways that uh, you can create some value for people. I also do a lot of location recording. As as a, an audio engineer, I've got several different location recording rigs. It's mostly concerts that we record. Uh, we'll go in and do sixty four tracks live of you know a, a church or a theater or sometimes a larger concert venue. Um, and then I have assistants that work for me that sometimes take those out and and do those things as well. So that's. Uh, the majority of the audio engineer part of my life, uh, the educator part of my life it involves teaching some private lessons mm -hmm. uh, from time to time. When it makes sense financially, I'll go out and do short little clinic-y things, uh, usually guitar center clinics or school clinics or something. Um, they either have to fit into my schedule or, like I say, it, maybe it's financially lucrative enough to do, say, a week of these things. Uh, occasionally, I'll do some of those things. Um, I, I, I do act as a product ambassador for different companies. Mm -hmm. So on social media, when you're, 
when you uh, see me talking about um, a product, and, and I try and let you know when I'm affiliated with a company, um, I've got a picture I'm going to put up with Promark Sticks this week because I've been trying out some new things that they're offering. And uh, it, it's no secret that I'm on the hunt to make a stick. Mm -hmm. But um, whether or not that's going to land in the Promark camp is anybody's guess. Right. And if it doesn't, then... Uh, yeah, you know, maybe there's some maybe there's some things ab about those Promark sticks that would keep me there. You know, right. that, like maybe there's some feature I don't know, like fire grain right. that I go, I have to have that in the stick I use. Right. So uh, obviously, I love Promark sticks. They make great sticks. Uh, with all the companies, uh, Piesty I've been with since '97. Promark I've been with since '97. Um, and uh, there are a few other companies that I've got those kind of relationships with uh, that we find ways from time to time for me to make some money uh, touting their products or demonstrating their products right. or uh, in, in the case of sponsors for this podcast, Waves has sponsored this podcast. You can go to dialadrummer.net uh, slash waves and check out specials. Uh, a little bit of that money comes, you know, comes back if somebody spends some money. Right. So um, there's that, that one. Um, Gee whiz, man, there's a whole lot of others. There's sure, consulting. Sure. You know, because I do all these other kinds of work, there's consulting work that I'll do. Uh, because I live in the technology space, there are a lot of people that want to know how to use technology to, to do creative projects. So consulting is a whole bucket that I can go into. Uh, the new bucket for me, and it ties into this week's sponsor. I started a brand new company brand called Session Ace, mm -hmm. and you can find it at sessionace.com. Uh, the first product we have rolled out is this new in-ear monitor, dual driver in-ear monitor that we're using right now. And um, that's a whole. That's the first in a whole long line of products right. that we're going to be putting out over the next year. So um, one of the things that I had to start taking a look at uh, in, my, uh, in my why and my how was right now in my income streams, I always trade time for dollars mm -hmm. and that doesn't scale very well and at a certain point you hit a ceiling and i've hit that ceiling i'm making just about as much as i can possibly make per hour for the number of hours i can physically stay awake <laughs> and so i'm capping out right and there are things i want to do in my life that require that i uh don't burn out. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. I stay alive, yeah. I stay sane. You still got to live. Still got <laughs> so, let's get into that discussion of why would somebody need multiple income streams? Why can't you just play drums and kind of let that be it? Well, that's a loaded question. Well, it, it's there's a lot Does of it mean you suck? No. No. It 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 could be anything. It could be the um, cuz you know the situation you're in. That is the common Old wives' tale, and I, I, I still hear it from guys nowadays. What if you the haven't attitude, made it? Yeah, you haven't made it if all you do from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep is play drums, or get on the road and ride on a bus and play drums for two hours a night, and right. you haven't made it at that point. Interesting. It's still a common. It's sure. still a common. Uh, it's the old "What are you going to fall back on?" kind of a conversation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. So to answer the question, so it's a loaded question. There's multiple answers. So you, you know, to say you haven't made it if you're not, uh, I mean, you can play seven days a week and still struggle, versus if you play five days a week for better shows. Hey, hang on a second. Let me wrap my mind around that a second. Hang on. <laughs> Take a pause, take a breath. Can you please repeat that to me so I can wrap my mind around that concept? You could play seven days a week. That's Monday through Saturday. No, Monday through Sunday. <laughs> seven. I want all the days. Man, you're supposed to rest on Sunday. Don't you know that? Well, most, Some people, most of anyway. us are working on a church gig. Yeah. So Sunday to Saturday. Sunday is our one of our busiest days of the week. Yeah, it is. You know, it is. Because we're fortunate to have church gigs. At, at least so. in Atlanta it is. Uh, so, yeah. But if you're playing 50 to $75 gigs right. and putting in, you know, 200 hours of your time and you wonder why you can't pay your light bill, yeah, it's time to think of something else. <laughs> and I don't mean get out of music. I just mean look at better opportunities. Right, exactly. You know? um, and that's a whole show topic. Like, is it better it is. to play five gigs that each pay $50 a piece right. or play one, one gig, gig that pays 250 bucks? Right. 
Because I'll, I, I will guarantee you we'll find people on both sides of that argument. Absolutely. And that'll be another show. <laughs> so I didn't mean to interrupt No, no, you. no. You're fine. Sorry. Um, man, this is a load. Of, there's a lot of avenues to this. So, you know, whether you're doing studio work, that's one source of playing right. income. Um, teaching, that's a good one. There's a lot of great teachers in yeah. town. There's cool. a 770 number. Let's try it. You know what? We ought to just go Take ahead and it. jump on, on yeah. this one. 770. That's our that's our home locale, so this may be safe. Hey, who I got on the line? I'll give you three guesses, my friend. <laughs> I saw that 656, <laughs> and I went, George Sandler. <laughs> What's up, George? <laughs> How are hey, you? Hey, guys. How you doing? I'm taking a little break from creating a revenue stream of my own, so I thought I'd call in. Yeah, nice. I just saw where you're going to start uh, running front of house for pay, like every other Sunday or something. That's right. That's one of yep. I sure am. Um, it's gonna. It's an easy thing. It's a small band, kind of a low volume thing, and it might be easy, kind of just to cut my teeth on for a while and then go from there. Right. You know, it's it's you know, guitar, bass, drums, acoustic guitar, piano, three vocalists, no tracks. Yeah. No. No. No gymnastics. <laughs> nice. You know, just, just running sound. That's yeah. nice. You're gonna enjoy um, that. Um, Mute, unmute, mute. I'm, I, dude, I had a great time Sunday. I did. So, you know, it's it's funny you should mention the revenue stream thing. I mean, I've, I've been thinking about the very stuff that I have been doing right. to make money. And one of the things besides playing all kinds of things is a lot of, a lot of the churches that I have worked with in the past, some of their drummers don't, they either can't tune or they don't want to tune, or they don't like to maintain a kit, and they just come in there and play and leave and play and leave and play and leave. And as right. you know, a lot of churches do a Wednesday night service, maybe a Wednesday rehearsal, two services on a Sunday morning and a Sunday night service. So the kit gets used a lot. Right. Yeah. And a lot of times by different players. So what I do is I charge a fee to go and change the heads out, make them, tune them up, do any repairs that are necessary. Of course, they buy the heads yep. and they buy the parts. But that's just another way you can make some money. There are a couple of guys in Nashville that are doing that for the clubs. Yeah. I see that in the Nashville Drummers Forum all the time. Uh, there are a few, at least two guys I know of that sort of make the rounds to a lot of the clubs, and they make sure that there's reasonably fresh heads, that felts are, because things disappear yeah. off these kits. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and these guys, have they make a little bit that's of money. That's the sad thing to me is how many people don't respect somebody else's property. And that, you know, I'm sure you see it, George. <laughs> yeah, George, you got a story, I'm sure. Oh, my goodness. Dude, I, I, the last time I went to a church, this is in Rome, Georgia. And they were going, man, our bass drum just sounds terrible. I said, and it was time to change heads. I mean, I like, I keep, I don't know about you guys, but on the kit that I use a lot, if I use a kit a lot or whatever, I change heads probably every month. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, I change a lot of drum heads. Yeah. But... These guys go six months, and that's fine. So I get up there, and, I'm, and I pull, I drag everything out of the glass enclosed booth because we know how we love those. Oh yeah, the fishbowl. And lo and behold, the bass, the bass drum head was front bass drum head was had a had a thirteen inch gash in it. And it's a twenty two inch drum, I, I, right? It was, <laughs> it, was, it was more opening than yeah, it was right. like, like, sealed well, up. Here's your problem: you've got a front head that. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, it was still, and I'm like, but you could have, if somebody would have taken 30 seconds, just take a good look at it and go, hey, that front head's busted. You can yeah. store your laundry in that bass that's, drum. That's, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. But it's amazing, you know, the maintenance thing that gets lost on, especially the churches. There's so many things that oh, buddy. are neglected. <laughs> yeah. That's too bad. Yeah. Talk to Paul Montaneri has a couple of great stories. Oh, I bet. About how a pastor used to come in every Sunday with a pedal that's, that's been destroyed or a snare drum and whatnot. And he goes, man, these guys aren't drummers. They're just volunteers. It's like, yeah, but dude, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> but anyway, so my, my thing has just been to play as many different styles, but add some tech work in there and add right. some, you know, running sound. And you do a fair amount of programming too, don't you, George? I do, I do. I, and then here lately, there's not been as much of a call for it, but that's always a tool that I have. 
And, you know, with that, it's just a matter of communicating with the client. What, what kind of format do they want? Do, do they want a WAV file? Right. Do I need to give them a Pro Tools session? Do I need to give them whatever? I mean, I can do whatever they want. But, yes, I do a fair amount of programming as well. Ableton stems. Actually, so. I had, a, uh, I had a, a thing I did for a producer here in town uh, a few weeks ago who – um, he was working with, I, I won't say names because this was like top shelf artists and producers and engineers, but he had gotten a whole session from an artist producer that he couldn't do anything with. He's like, Brian, I see that there, there's actual stuff on this file, but when I open the file, I don't see anything. And, you know, it only took me an hour's worth of time to sort it all out. But I, and, and I knew as soon as I asked him, can you find out what, where, what was the format it came from right. and how were things formatted on the media? Like I, there were about three questions that I needed him to add, answer for me. And once he answered them, I went, I can fix your problem pretty quickly. It'll cost you an hour's worth of my time. And, uh, and I made, there was an hour's worth of my card rate that I got taken care of right there just by sitting and popping and clicking a mouse and solving somebody's problem exactly yeah. you know, here's here's stuff that six months six months from now will probably be in the top 10 uh and it would have remained in this thing that nobody could get the files out of because they couldn't even see them right uh other than knowing that they were there right uh, and and again it's just being of service and and taking your knowledge and and figuring out what to do with it so yeah definitely I think unless you're Vinnie Caluda or somebody of that nature, you have to diversify and, and get more tools in your toolbox rather sure. than, hey, man, I just play drums. Right. And I've even seen Vinnie's got a new – he's got a new thing that he's doing. Have you seen the, the live lesson. muse right. thing? Is it kind of a live streaming thing uh -uh. where people pay? Yeah, you, I think I paid like eighteen bucks to watch like an hour long or two hour long in studio concert with a bunch of like top level musicians. I think that's a new income stream for him. Wow. I, I think it's an interest as much as it is an income stream. But again, that'll get to. Well, and part of it too is that. the touring game has changed a lot too. Oh, you yeah. know, it's yeah, it's the circle of a list gigs to go get is a lot smaller because they don't tour as much either. Right. You know. Right. You'd be surprised, again, a topic for another show, you'd be surprised at how much those high-level gigs don't pay. <laughs> then there's that, too. That's uh, right. You may, you may be on yep, yep, yep. the the best-selling tour of 2017 for nine weeks. Right. You know, you do a summer run of 12 to 16 weeks. Last I counted, there were 52 weeks in the year. And then you come home and there's no work left because everybody took it. <laughs> and this is where I put the cricket sound effect in on the uh, recorded version. <laughs> cricket, cricket. Yep, yep, yep. So, yeah. And, you so. know, one, one thing I'm sure you guys are going to discuss, you know, one thing I'm sure you guys are going to discuss with revenue streams is I don't have the patience for it because I'm constantly acquiring gear. But there are some of our buddies and, you know, a good one who is buying gear and flipping it. Yeah. You know, he'll he'll buy buy drum gear and flip it, and buy drum gear and flip it, or whatever. Yep. I I don't have patience for that. I I just don't. And I you know, because I'm like I said, constantly still trying to acquire certain things. But you know, those guys, there's some guys out there making money doing that. God bless them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, we, that it, it's funny you say that. I had earmarked that very thing for us to talk about a little bit later, and and brainstorming some things well, i've jumped two, the gun i'm sorry think, like, man no 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 that's no, great it's but great you're right that's a whole nother avenue that. that you know you got to have a certain set of patience and yeah you know be good at what you're buying yeah definitely knowing that definitely. you're going to well you know i know it. this is a drum show uh george but as somebody starting out as a really kind of starting a whole new journey as a front of house guy especially in a church uh mm -hmm. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> yeah, somebody knows my inflection. There. Sorry. Um, uh, especially uh, running Santa Church. Is there any way that I can help you? Is there any questions that you got that help you navigate those waters? We'll take a second to do that while I got you on the phone. We'll you know, here here's my thing. The the, the thing that that's cool and that it, that it's also can be the bumpy road is that everybody's using digital mixers and they're all somewhat the same, but they're all different too. Yeah, Does true. that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, I, 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 when you're trying to learn something, I mean, do you just 
are you a dive in guy or do you look, I'm going to crack the manual open and then dive in as I crack it. I have a weird hybrid way of doing things. I usually take a first pass just uh, on what's sitting there on the surface. What can I see? What do I know I need to do right this moment? But I almost always have either on my laptop or a computer or an iPad or something. I always have a PDF of the manual nearby, some way that I can do a quick search where I can get information I need really, really quickly. And after I do a good first pass, first run, it may be a rehearsal. It may be I borrow one and use it for a little while. I like to do it at rehearsals because it, it makes me know what I don't know. Right. Uh, then I'll go through and I'll do a deep dive into the manual. And some companies will make really good uh videos like video walkthroughs yamaha uh, when i first learned how to use a pm5d yamaha actually put together a dvd that you could get this is back when you got dvds um you could get their dvd that walked you through all of the functions of the console nice. so wow. after i'd done two rehearsals and had read through most of the manual to sit with that dvd at the end of two hours i knew everything i needed to know right uh, for me i i I came up with this hybrid way of doing it because I need to go from not knowing something to knowing as much as I can know in the least amount of time. Right. So in, it, I found just reading the manual to start didn't – it confused me more than it helped me. Sure. Uh, nowadays, it seems like the apps that are going with digital mixers for front of house – are really close to the interface and functionality of the mixer itself and the hardware. Right. So sometimes you can, if you can't physically get your hands on that mixer, you can get the app and work with that for a while. And that, that'll help you get the ins and outs okay. and know where things are. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a hybrid approach. It's jump in there and just, you know, sink or swim for two hours with a rehearsal and then start digging into the documentation. And I always keep a pad nearby, so if there's something that I have, I'm having an issue with, I'll make a little note, and then when I'm not in the firing line, I'll go back and look and figure out what it is. I had that this week when I was trying to, uh, I was trying to figure out how to patch in this new rolling console I've only been using for about a month. This M5000. Um, there's a weird way that you have to patch um, different kinds of effects, like verbs. It's not as simple as just putting on an aux and it's. Send it, it wherever. It, yeah, it because of the routing, the way that routing is set up, it was really weird. So I just on my little pad, I just wrote verb. Uh, what was it? Verb route. Right. And I, that was just all I needed for later. So three o'clock in the afternoon, when I'm by myself sitting there with nothing to do for five minutes, I go through the PDF of the manual and do a quick search and figure out how to do it. So that's that's the quickest way for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, man. I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to let you go. Okay. I got, I'm going to ask you one question, and then I'm going to let you go. How, how, this is one of the things that, you know, a, as a musician, one of the things that sometimes you bristle out or whatever, especially if you're already playing what you consider soft, is, hey, man, I need you. It's, it's still too loud on stage. Can you guys bring it down? Right. And so as a musician, you kind of go, dude, I, I'm, I'm barely hitting the drums, which you might be. Uh, but then like, it's a, like you said, moving to the other side of the room, you know, I had to do it yesterday. It was like, guys, I, I, I've, I've got to get you to pull back on the snare drum. Right. And you know, you try not the, I think the biggest thing is don't be a, a jerk about it. Right. Um, but I mean, you just have to do it. Is there any way you, is there anything you recommend besides don't be a jerk or trying to be whatever? Just, I mean, there's only so far you can pull the fader down. That's true. You know so what I mean? And where one, it affects one suggestion is, is in this situation, are you miking the snare drum? Mm-hmm. A uh, kick snare and, uh, and two overheads. All right, so using. don't use the snare mic. Just use the overheads and the kick, and you'll be amazed yeah. at how much better it sounds. Here's here's a front of house trick that you can try if you're in that, in that situation. Um, if, if you're in a situation where you're not going to use the snare mic, there's always going to be something that you're missing when you get to... Uh, that point yep. where it's just overheads and kick what you can do is you can use the eq depending on if you're a digital mixer you got all kinds of stuff you can do but eq in just the stuff that you're missing right so like if it's not sizzly or snappy enough like over eq the sizzly snappy in the snare drum mic and roll it in about 20 percent all of a sudden you'll think that you have wow, okay. a snare drum mic on there 
And if you were to listen to that channel, and this is the counterintuitive thing, if you were to solo that snare drum channel, it's going to sound like ass. It's going to sound awful because it's going to be all of the thing that you're missing. Uh, sort of like listening to the bottom snare drum mic by itself. Right. You know, you'd never put that up as the main thing. But if I were blending, uh, you know, you can blend in that underside snare drum mic and all of a sudden you got this nice yeah. sizzly thing you can do that with uh, with that snare drum mic in that scenario and people will think that you're using the mic you know like you normally would and right. uh, you'll look like a genius because for some reason all it's got all the clarity and the sizzliness cool last question what's your favorite digital board Right now, the 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 Roland M five thousand is my favorite digital console, and people that use the Digicos and all the really expensive stuff are going to laugh at me for it. But I guarantee you, number one, it's a great sounding console. Uh, it's the most bang for your buck in that price range. In like the twenty to twenty five thousand dollar price range, there is not a console that does more. Uh, the thing I like about wow. about it is. The internal architecture, the software of the whole console is open so that there are all kinds of things you can do that you can't do on most digital consoles. Um, it basically has 128 pathways for audio, and you can make them whatever you want them to be. They can be audio inputs. They can be auxiliaries. They can be DCAs. They can be uh, alternate um uh, minus mixes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that's one way I use it is I do a minus mix for uh, for my broadcast. And if somebody sends me a rider and I put together their whole show and then they show up and they have two or three things extra, on most consoles, you put it out there on the outside, right? Like right. you have to remember the last three channels are the things I didn't know about. With this console, you can start there. Like somebody brings an extra acoustic guitar. Instead of one, they've got two acoustic guitar uh, channels they need. And they've got an extra keyboard. So you tack it onto the end, like channel 50, 52, whatever. And then once you know that's my setup, you've in the virtual world, because all of this is virtual, you can virtually, physically pick up the channel and put it in line where it needs to go. Oh, that's so cool. if I've got um, you know two keyboard tracks and I want that new third one to be the third one in my row, the way it lays out on the console, I can just pick it up and move it over right. and everything moves over. You don't copy paste. You don't do any of that stuff. You literally just pick the fader up, drag it over and drop it where you want to go. That saved me so much time, like the first two times I used it, that I went, I'm sold just on that. So that's my that's my new favorite one. It's not one you're going to see a whole lot out in the wild. Yeah, that's a major, major board yeah. right there. Uh -huh. Yeah, you're not going to see it a lot in the wild. Um, yeah. I, I'm For the, the more budget line stuff, the stuff that's more affordable, I like the Persona stuff. I like the Persona. I also like the QSC Touch Mix. Yeah. yeah Those are really nice one. boards. Yeah. The... the uh, the Personas, the regular Studio Live AIs, I've been a pretty big fan of. Um, if you're operating like I operate uh, with the the 32RM AI, the rack mount version, most of the time I'm running from a control surface that's the iPad. I like it. Um, they've got some weird latency issues with the hardware controller because I've got a hardware controller. And there's about like a five millisecond, five, 10 millisecond latency problem with those. And that's the only reason I'm not just lights out uh, excited about those because that latency really does make a difference, especially if you're doing what I do a lot of times, which is run front of house and do a broadcast mix at the same time. That latency can be a real, right. real bummer. But, what are uh, you getting to use in the church gig? It's a, it's an older mixer. It's an Allen and Heath iLive. So it's yeah, really yeah. simple. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a nice board. Fairly straightforward. Sounds fine. You know, feeder air feel good. I, you know, it, it, and it's fairly laid out. It's laid out really well. You just go through the pages and EQ sounds good. And like I said, this is a small, it's in a traditional chapel. So you got that to deal with and you're never going to get all that out. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the oh, yeah. wood floors and the high ceiling and all that stuff. But you do what you can. And it's, like I said, it's fairly simple. There's not a big orchestra. There's not, you know, eight praise team members and two acoustic guitars and two electrics and loops and drums and, you know, keyboards and all that crap. You just It's just pretty simple. And I think that's, you know, that's fine for me right now. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. You know what I mean? Congrats, yeah. so, man. Congrats. So, but, man, I appreciate you guys' time. I'm going to... 
walk downstairs and try to make some more money. Go, right on. Go for it. Go <laughs> talk for to it. you later, George. Thanks for calling. See you. Thanks to George for calling. Absolutely. And uh, it's good to talk to him. It's good to see him uh, going through a new journey with uh, with this new income stream that he's got, and which raises that – goes. we go back to that question of why. Um, I can remember the exact moment when I knew that I needed to do more than just play drums. Mm -hmm. You might remember there was a Vic Firth poster. This has been a – maybe even two decades ago. Um, it said, Dave likes to mix. Mm -hmm. And there was a picture of Dave Weckl sitting in his home studio in front of a mixing console. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. Uh, Dave Weckl's a drummer. You're right. Why is he sitting behind the mixing console? And why are they doing an ad that says, Dave likes to mix? Because it helps his drums sound that much better. Yeah. And come to find out, I started seeing his name pop up on more and more things as a mixing engineer. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize how good he is. Yeah. <laughs> He's really so good. good. He's very, very good. Yeah. And then DVD projects. Yeah. You know, you'd see like a Mike Stern concert, and you look at the credits, and the mixing engineer for the concert DVD was Dave Weckl. Right. And he may or may not be playing drums on right. it. You know? Uh, I think... If I had, if we got a but chance, that's a, to ask that's a great him, example. That there's, I mean, so there's a guy that, a yes, he's a legendary drummer, right, right, but he's genius with product development yeah. and sales, yep, yep, and engineering, yep, yeah. I mean, he's a that's a great example. Right, Tom so, Knight, we're gonna need to put that one on the list of guests that we need to acquire, and you would be the guy to help us with that. So, uh, we'd, I'd like to talk with him specifically about this. Absolutely. Like the, the thinking behind it. I mean, I, I think I know what the answers are, but I think there's some surprises in there too. But it'd be fun to get his perspective on but it. But talking about drummers as engineers, there was a period of time in Simon Phillips's career that I know because I followed it. Like when I started down this road of, oh, so drummers can be audio engineers too. Simon Phillips very quickly came up on mm -hmm. my radar for that. And there was a period of time there, especially right before Toto, where I think he was engineering more than he was playing drums. Right. And he owns a nice recording he studio does. right now, now. And that's a big part of his life is the engineering thing. And that got me started to thinking, well, why are that? Those are top shelf guys. Right. Well, part of it too, though, you spend all your time in a studio and recording. Right. And, you know, as drummers, it's a little different now, but back in the day when you were the first one to lay your tracks, mm -hmm. You were the first one to be hanging out with the engineer yeah. and the producer in the control room yeah. learning, Yeah, you know, and going, oh. And then as drummers, it's nice to have your own facility because then we don't have to schlep drums to somebody's rehearsal spot. It's already there. Yeah, you're set up. You're good there. to go. You can yeah. record everything. So, well, I know I told a story in, in one of our previous episodes about uh, about my car getting repossessed. And I think it was about this. That was about the same time that I saw this poster. And, and again, you know, I'm always trying to think five steps ahead. And the wheels started turning. Like, how do I keep from the obvious answer from how do I keep from getting my car repossessed is go work at Guitar Center. Sure. That may not be what I want to do. I may not like retail. I may not like that environment. It may not pay enough for the time. There's so many reasons why maybe that's not a great fit. There, I do have friends that retail is a great fit for them. Right. And it's something that they enjoy doing outside of their playing life. So, uh, so I started asking that question, like, why are some of my favorite drummers um, not just playing drums? And it didn't take too long to start hearing those stories of, well, yeah, I mean, I'm on the road eight months of the year, but I got four months of the year that I got to do something with. Right. Or, yeah, yeah, I played on four big records, but it took me two days on every one of those records. Right. And, you know, eight days. How of do recording. I fill up the other 20 hours of the day? <laughs> yeah. It's like there's 365 days in the year, folks. How you can't just play four, you know, four days worth of top shelf hit making records well, and, and, and build your entire year off. That. The other thing too, is sometimes you go through a door that you don't think relates, but opportunity presents itself. And well, sometimes it can actually circle back and become or create a better situation right. because you weren't 
focused on this. You tried something different, but it made this better. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And there's, there's don't be afraid of opportunity. I mean, there's so many ways to do, make income musically. You just have to get out there and do it. Well, and that, that gets us to our next point, which is for someone who is, let's say just a drummer Mm -hmm. or or this works for anybody that's just any kind of musician. But how would you go about building those, uh, those multiple income streams? I think that's part of that answer is when you're looking at the landscape of your life, what are the opportunities to be of service that are presenting themselves? Mm -hmm. When somebody, you know, when you pull up to a church and you're going to use their house kit and you notice that the heads are shot and all the felts are gone, you can either look at that as, well, this place cheap. They don't want to put new stuff on there. I can't believe this. I got to play this piece. Crap. You right. can like have that kind of like just venomous kind of um, attitude about it, or you can see an opportunity. Right. You can go, you know what? If this place is having that problem, there are probably tons of other places right. that are having the same problem. Somebody needs to fill that as a service. Well, and the first step of that is if, Play the kit that's all crapped out. Do the gig well. Smile about it. Yeah. Make the suggestion that, hey, you guys need some help here. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not the only, guy. Not only did you get a gig, but then you got the work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a twofold. Like, you're actually making this harder. You're yeah. making this harder to do to do a great job for you. And that and I guess that's, that's the real key with any of this stuff. And, and this is a quick public service announcement. It's right. going to break topic here for a second. Oh, okay. If you are playing... And there's a lot of churches in town. Okay, I'm going to put you on that camera so you talk right to that camera. PSA for the day. There are a lot of churches in town that use a lot of different drummers. Drummers or all musicians, respect the gear. Don't walk in, take the clutch off the hi-hat stand, take cymbal felts because you don't have any at home, take the stick collection. Be respectful. It's not your gear. A church is kind enough to provide, whether it's top of the line, midline, whatever. Right. Respect that it's not your property yeah. and leave it alone. <laughs> That's your PSA for today. There you go. Folks. Sorry. <laughs> I, I just well, think there's yeah. a lot of people don't get it. Uh, on my Sunday gig, one of the, the other performance spaces where we run concurrent services, one is a contemporary space where there's a, there's a house kit there. And I can't tell you, there's at least four times I've had to buy high hat clutches. And at least once a month, we're replacing felts and uh, symbol sleeves and all kinds of different things. I'm like, guys, Number one, if you don't have them and you can't afford them, I would prefer you come directly to me and go, hey, Brian, I'm broke. Could you give me some cymbal felts? I would feel much better about you if you would do that than if you just take the damn things and leave me to figure it out when the next guy doesn't have them. (laughs) And the cymbals are metal and metal, and you're like, why is this so bad? (laughs) Yeah. yeah, and as but expensive right. as some symbols are, I'm not even there. There have been a few times on on we haven't really talked about backline right, right. kits as a subject for, or or if you're sitting in and playing somebody, don't rearrange the poor guy's yeah. kit. Just sit down and play yeah. for ten there, minutes. There have been times that I've gotten backline on kits where they didn't have, and I keep some, but when you've got five symbol stands and all five of them don't have the little nylon washer i only have three so i'm going to put up three symbols i might need five right but i'm only going to put up three because i'm not unless i've got some gaff tape and i can fix it that way i'm not going to use those other symbol stands so tangent sorry (laughs) so so yeah that's the first thing the first thing i think here's here's the way to not do this I see it all the time in the in the music production world, uh, especially with young interns that I have. Um, they want to be a. Please forgive me for this. If you're offended by what I'm about to do, uh, I'm just going to preface it. So when a, when a young person comes to me and I say, "So what? What is it that you want to do with your career? I want to be a producer, man. I want to make some beats. I want to. I'm going to drop some hot beats. And I want to have hit songs." It sounds almost exactly like that. Every now, some of the words are different. Some sure. of them are more colorful, but um, 
I see it all the time in the audio engineering and the music production world, guys wanting to do something for which there is no audience for the service. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a pretty safe bet that if you start from the standpoint of what do people need? Right. What can I provide? Yeah. What do I have the ability to provide them in terms of a service? That's a good, safe place to start. Um, the other one is, what do I need? Right. What what is what is a pain point for me in just the course of every day doing stuff? Uh, I think that um, Mike Johnson has a great story of when he was trying to split his time between the road and teaching that he would have to go on the road and he would have to go long enough that. He couldn't just sub the lessons, and he didn't want to lose the students. So there's the pain point right there of, I have a problem, and I need to solve this problem. So all of a sudden, he creates these little drum videos for his students to use that he can record on his own time. And that way, he can retain the student and retain the fee in some cases. Flash forward 10 years. Let's not mince words about it. Mike Johnston makes millions of dollars a year. Well, Mike's Lessons.com makes millions of dollars a year in video drum lessons. Right. Let's don't let's don't uh, bury the lead on this one. He took a pain point, something that I need this, my students need this, and parlayed it into the most successful video drum lesson Absolutely. site. Absolutely. And I dare say the most successful video lesson site for musicians at all. Agreed. Agreed. And to his credit, along the way, has turned into a really beautiful player. Oh, man. I tell you what. It's funny because he even, even very self-deprecating about how he used to play compared to now. It's been nice to watch that guy's progression as a a drummer, musician, drummer. We're talking about somebody that has done it beautifully and very well. Man. Kudos to you, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Shout out, man. We're fans. We're fans, big time. So um, that that also, while we're talking about a, a Mike Johnston, one of the other questions I think you can ask is, what am I good at doing? Mm-hmm. You know, Mike, like a lot of people, was great at teaching. How many people do we know? I mean, we won't name names. Right. How many people we know teach lessons at music stores that hate teaching? Right, right. You go have beers and burgers with a bunch of drummers and three of six of them complain about the crappy students and how they hate having to go every afternoon. And I can't believe, but they're doing it because there's a paycheck associated with it. Like uh, if you're trying to, if you're trying to fill a service because you see there's money there. I mean, you have to ask what are people going to pay for? That's one of my next bullet points. What are people going to pay money for? But if, People are paying you money to do something that you don't enjoy. Number one, the scalability of that is very limited. And those kids are getting the short end of the stick. You're not going to offer the best service. If you're going to offer a service, let's, let's just go ahead and say right now, if you're going to ask anyone for money for a product or a service, especially a service, because you can control that in the moment. You should give them the absolute best service Mm -hmm. that you can give them because their time and their money are very valuable to them. And if you can't give them that service, you need to give them the opportunity to get that from someone who does want to give them the absolute best. So uh, if if you go into it with that kind of attitude, you know, if you go into it with the attitude of I want to make sure that uh, I'm going to I'm going to start being a drum tech for guys and I'm not being a drum tech because I'm hoping that being a drum tech is going to help me get my next big gig. I want a drum tech because, man, I'm a real geek about working on stuff. I love pulling drums apart. I love putting them back together. I love working on edges. I love uh, fixing stripped out. Like like, I like to hear the difference between a single ply head and a double ply head because I hear it. There's such a big difference. The difference between a coated head and a clear head, like if you're into that, 
being a tech is going to be a great way for you to open up a whole uh, other income stream that may become a primary business for you. Right. Because you love it. You're going to dive in and you're going to want to know everything about it. And you're going to wake up every day. And this is one of the big keys when we get into this whole topic of multiple income streams. If you have one income stream you don't like, that's bad. How many people get up every day and they go to jobs and right. they, they clock in and they're mumbling under they their breath? They clock out in the moment they <laughs> clock in. <laughs> and, and they look forward to the weekend and they look forward to Miller time and all these things. Like, that's horrible enough. Right. But in our case, you know, being working creative professionals, it, why stack two, three, or four of those on? Right. That's just pain on pain on pain. So... Pick something that you love, something right. you're passionate about. And if you can find this intersection of need with your passion, with what you're good at, then I think you got a good starting place for whatever it is. Agreed. And if you can take all of those and you can meet those at the four-way intersection of add commerce to it, what will people pay money for? I think you got a winner. Uh, if if there are five people that are doing that same thing, you might not want to jump in that pool. There's a, a whole discussion we can have of trying to find a place that's unique in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I have an income stream right now. One income stream we haven't talked about a whole lot in this thing is the pro I've stayed away from products. I've gotten into services. We, we may need to do a part two. We will. We're going to do it. <laughs> we're going to do because we're going to have questions about this when we're yeah. done. Um, I started out probably 12 or 13 years ago in this whole um, musician as front of house guy and specifically with churches. Uh, and that was at a time when there wasn't a lot of that. And mm -hmm. I see more of this kind of thing um, and, and the market is starting to really grow where I'm seeing a lot of musicians transition from playing on stage to front of house or playing on stage to video production for live events to those kind of things. And um, what for me was a very unique place in the world is becoming a lot less unique. The, the main selling point, and I had to, uh, within the past couple of weeks, I've had meetings with some folks about changing uh, a pretty large income stream for me in that segment of what I do. And in meeting with other people with other opportunities, um, despite my track record and despite my experience, I have competition. Mm -hmm. I have other people that can deliver similar services, services um, for much less than I can. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely have, I have a rate and, uh, and I'm topped out on it, I think, or pretty close to topped out on it. So, um, so for me, I'm having to look at, all right, so... What, where do people have a need? What am I good at? What do I enjoy doing? What can I get them to pay me money for? But now it's a question of how many people are also in that space? Right. And as that space gets more and more crowded, and this gets right back up to our very first topic of why. You may be in a market where there are more drummers than gig opportunities. Mm -hmm. So you can either try and find your unique proposition, your unique quality that makes you so different and that much better from everyone else, or you can make one up. A lot of people do that. I see that. Or you can decide, I'm going to put my ego aside for a second. And I'm going to figure out all these other things and find another way mm -hmm. and compete in a space where you are one of or the only one. And, um, and so for me, one of my newer income streams is in beginning to offer products. Right. There are products that on the side I've been developing for myself because I enjoy it. Right. There's a there's a, a drummer who shall re remain unnamed, but it ain't hard to figure out, who has a lot of signature products 
that he's put out over the last 20 years. His name is associated with a lot of products. And other than him being a drummer and um, putting his name on something, it might not make a lot of sense to you until you understand that he's got a background in woodworking and cabinetry and like building stuff. Right. So when you understand that, all of a sudden it makes total sense that he would develop some thing that screws into a cowbell or something that screws onto the side of a floor tom that you hit and make a sound with. Uh, because the guy loves working with these with wood and other mechanical things. He has a gift for it. He's already kind of doing it for himself. Right. And he's found an opportunity in the market for other people that need the same kinds of things. It's a winning proposition just about every single time. So for me, kind of on the side, I've been working with different companies to develop things that I wanted. I'm a watch person. I like watches because um, I, as I've tried to get more and more productive, I've tried to get further and further away from looking at the time on my phone. Because when I pull my phone out, there's a text message or there's an email. You get alert, distracted or, by all the other stuff. And down the rabbit hole I go. The great thing about a watch is if I need to look at the time, I can look at my wrist. I see what time it is and I get right back to what I was doing. So right. watches are something that I've always really loved because I like the look of them. I like uh, if, if it's not too heavy, I can still play drums with it. But I also like that, that productivity hack. Mm -hmm. of being able to stay on task. So it only makes sense as I'm looking for really cool watches that nobody has that I start talking with boutique watch manufacturers and going, hey, I like that watch. Could you change that one thing about it that I don't like and make a watch for me like that? And all of a sudden I find out that apparently a lot of the people like watches too. Right. Uh, with the in-ears and we'll double back as we get to the tail end of our show, that's a that's a uh, that's a call out to let people know that we're almost done with this little uh, this little theatrical production. Uh, when when I started working on these in ears about a year ago, I had a pain point. Uh, I got tired of stepping on five hundred dollars Shure Universal Fit in ears, and I wasn't going to spend a thousand bucks on a set of custom molds that I'd step on and feel even worse about. <laughs> right. So what do I do about that? Well. I start finding out where do all these pieces come from that people make this stuff out of and then go to those folks and go, hey, can I take these pieces, parts, and put something together that uh, isn't quite like what other people are putting together and make something for me? Sure, no problem. Uh, and over the course of the year, we develop uh, an, an in-ear monitor that uh, is affordable, that sounds better than what I was paying 500 bucks for. Right. And uh, I can do it at a scale that allows me to make enough for other people to have them too at a very affordable price. And that brings us right to our sponsor, which is the Session Ace EST in-air monitor. Like I just segued right into that. Like If you go to dialdrummer.net slash EST, Support the show, support one of my income streams, uh, support what we do here to be of value to you by uh, by patronizing that new uh, new product, new sponsor. And uh, once we have, I got hats coming, I got tactical flashlights for stage. There's going to be a whole product line of great Session A stuff. So keep your eye on the site, even if you don't need ear monitors. And um, I think that's I think that's a good place for us to kind of stop. There's a ton more that we could talk about. Well, part two of this well, one. Well, part two, and uh, we'll, with part two, we will take your questions. Uh, so one of the things that you can do, you can email your question, dialadrummer at gmail.com com is our email address and uh, if you like any of this stuff please share it with your friends on social media we're on youtube facebook periscope twitter uh instagram follow us and uh you can tag us uh, hashtag dial a drummer if you if you if you're playing a gig and you want to show us your kit, uh, if you've got a, some kind of problem that you want to take a picture of and put it on your Instagram or your Facebook and you'll tag us, dial a drummer, we'll, uh, we'll get to it. We'll probably even answer it on the show. And that's all I got. It's a good one. That's a good one.
That was a good one. It's it's the kind of thing that uh, whether you're um, already a working professional or especially if you're younger and up and coming and you're thinking about becoming a working professional drummer, it's the sort of thing you need to think about now. Right. So that you don't have to wait until you're 35 or 42 and start developing these other gifts and see uh, these other opportunities. You could start at 17 or 18 years old, and by the time you're 35, you could have uh, – there's, there's actually a statistic that I saw the other day. And take this uh, as you will. There's a st- statistic I saw the other day that says that um, all millionaires – have at least seven income streams, wildly in, different, mm-hmm. you know, different income streams. So if this strategy of having multiple ways that you can always have income and avoid feast or famine, uh, if it works for millionaires, it'll work for 100,000 heirs. Right. It'll work for... Uh, for five figure a year guys, it'll work for guys that are working jobs that they hate right now, uh, delivering pizzas that happen to be really good drummers. If you just take these principles and understand that it works across the board, uh, and that you might not be able to just rely on playing music, no matter how good you are playing your instrument. Uh, I think you'll, uh, you'll be in a much better place and, uh, it'll take a little bit of time, take a little bit of work. You'll have to get away from TV a little bit. But um, that's not a bad thing. Not at all. Put in the hard work. You'll see the results. Yeah. And we're going to keep putting in the hard work every single week. And we will see you guys again next time. Go out there and be awesome. And uh, if you ever need us, make sure you dial a drummer. Thanks for tuning in. See ya. See ya.